when I first got up here. Um, I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts and uh, thank, uh, thank Tim and Mike is, is here. And uh, thank Tim back there that's uh, helping us with our audiovisual uh, ministry. Um, with uh, <clears throat> with Damien, Damien's our music music director, uh, amongst other responsibilities, but a music director also. And Tim, Tim is going to be like the assistant music director here, and uh, he's going to be doing um, uh, leading the singing on Wednesday nights. Uh, he does it for the, the main auditorium class during Sunday school, and uh, he will be uh, Brother Damien's backup in every way, and so we're excited about that. So Tim's getting actually even a little more involved here with our, uh, with our uh, audiovisual ministry, so praise the Lord for that. All right, we are looking at uh, Acts chapter 3. On Sunday nights, we're preaching through the book of Acts. And, and, it's, and we're going to be in the book of Acts for 28, for 28 weeks. And because we're going to preach every Sunday night, we're going to preach uh, a sermon from one chapter, from each chapter of the book of Acts. Are we, are we exhausting the book of Acts? By no means. Uh, we are just scraping t the tip of the iceberg. But uh, we are going to do that. And I wanted to take this opportunity to, uh, as we preach through Acts, to see how that the, the local New Testament church started. And, uh, and that is recorded. The history of the, of the beginning of the local New Testament church began in the book of Acts. And, and God detailed it pretty well for us there and told us everything that we need to know how that church got started. And so we're excited about that. And uh, tonight we are in chapter 3. So I want you to look at verse 1, chapter 3 of the book of Acts. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. This was a beggar, and alms just meant he was asking for money. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Think about this. As Peter and John are on their way to the temple, they, they come across this, this man that is begging alms. He, he was a crippled man, and he had uh, from, from birth he was crippled. And the Bible says that they healed him, and we're going to talk more about it as we go along. But, but he healed him, and think about it immediately. When God heals somebody, he does the job, and he does it right. And, uh, and this man jumped up. Keep in mind, this man had never walked. So not only did he receive strength in his bones, strength in his legs, he didn't have the muscle mass there to be able to just start leaping. The Bible says that he got up and began leaping. He didn't have the coordination there. But the Bible says that, that he got up and was leaping and walking and praising God. And this was quite the miracle. It's not that some man got up off the ground and stabbed staggered around and, and look, that would have been a miracle too. Scenes that he had never stood. But this man stood and ran around and was leaping and was praising God. And it's quite a miracle here. And so we're going to look at this and, and, and draw some points from it tonight. And the name of the sermon is The Opportunity of the Church. The Opportunity of the Church. Now, uh, well, let's pray really quick. Father, bless us tonight. Holy Spirit of God, please empower me as a speaker and empower every listener and watcher. And uh, may your will be done in this service. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
have an illustration for you here. Some years ago, an energetic young man began as a clerk in a hardware store. Like many old time hardware store, the inventory included thousands of dollars worth of items that were obsolete. And I don't know if you've ever been in a store like that. I have, I've seen this. Or seldom called for by customers. The young man was smart enough to know that no thriving business could carry such an inventory and still show a healthy profit. He proposed a sale to get rid of the stuff. The owner was reluctant, but finally agreed to let him set up a table in the middle of the store and try to sell off a few of the oldest items. Every product was priced at 10 cents. The sale was a success, and the young fellow got permission to run a second sale. It, too, went over just as well as the first. This gave the young clerk an idea. Why not open a store that would sell only nickel and dime items? He could run the store, and his boss could supply the capital. The young man's boss was not enthusiastic. The plan will never work, he said, because you can't find enough items to sell at a nickel and a dime. You know, to be able to make a living, be able to make a profit. The young man was disappointed, but eventually went ahead on his own and made a fortune out of the idea. His name, the young man's name was F.W. Woolworth. Had this great idea to sell very cheap things, you know, items, inexpensive items, and uh, in the store, he became rich doing it. And his boss before him, uh, said it'll never happen it'll never work here's what his boss said <coughs> years later as nearly as I can figure it every word I used in turning wool work down has cost me about a million dollars so what's the point here the point is that the 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 boss couldn't see the vision he couldn't catch the vision he didn't understand that, that there was a great idea here and he didn't take the opportunity. He didn't grab the opportunity. He just stuck with, with what he knew and uh, didn't, he didn't step out on a new idea and take advantage of it. In Acts chapter 3, we see here how that God's work now uh, in the New Testament church has been given to the church. It has been delegated to the church. And we have an example of that at this healing, at what happened here. And we've got to understand that it is an opportunity of, to be used by God to do the work of God. It is not drudgery. And every, and every person, every member of every church, every believer has got to catch this vision. We have got to grab it, grab it, we've got to grasp it, and we've got to make it our own. We've got to take the opportunity and make it our own and be used of God. That is our purpose down here in this world. Not to be sprinkled into this world and just run off doing our own things, asking God to iron out the path before us. That's not it. God says, no, my people are to join me in my work. And he said, the thing that I'm going to begin called the New Testament church, the world had never seen anything like this. He said, it will be their, it will be their responsibility. It will be their job. But I like to look at it as it will be our opportunity to partner with God Almighty in his work and to do the work of God. Now, I always, I always say this when I say things like do the work of God and the works that we do and the service that we offer. These things are done through his spirit, through his power. They are actually Christ in us doing his work. We are simply a vessel. When Jesus Christ was on this earth, he was limited to the places that he could go. He was limited by the physical body that he was in. He could not be, he was not omnipresent. He was in the body that he was born in as a baby. But after uh, after the death on the cross and the resurrection, he now sits at the right hand of God and he indwells every believer in the person of the Holy Spirit. And now he can go wherever the believers will take him <coughs> and make no mistake. 
It is our job to take him to the world. It is our job to take him to our communities and to our counties and to our state and, and to, the, to the country and around the globe. It is our job to take him and allow him to do his work through us now. But as I said, I like to think of that job as being the great opportunity to partner with God. What else could possibly matter? What else could possibly matter than us fulfilling our purpose, which is to take Jesus around the world and to take his presence around the world and invite people to come into his presence just as we have. It is an opportunity. And we see that happening here uh, in, uh, in chapter 3 of the book of Acts. All right, point number one. The opportunity uh, to show the love of Christ. In verse 4, chapter 3, verse 4, you will see, the Bible says, And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, has said, Look on us. Look, we can't help anybody until we get out of our, get out of this mindset that this world and that this life is all about me. And, 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 you know, our life's schedule revolves around me and what the things that I like to do and the things that I want to do. <clears throat> As Peter and John walked by the man that day, they weren't distracted by me. They weren't distracted by I and what are we. No. As they walked by the man and probably saw him in front of them and walked over to him as he begged alms. As he was begging for money, they walked straight up and hit to him and said, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to show the love of God to somebody today. It, it, it is. It's our responsibility, but it is our opportunity to show the love of God. And that first happens as we take notice of somebody in need. We've, as I said, we've got to get our, our minds off of ourselves and get, instead of looking in the mirror at that ugly mug that looks back at us in the morning, we need to start looking out to the left and to the right and down the road and down the road and start seeing the people that God is placing along our pathway things that I like to refer to as divine appointments where we are to take Jesus to that person. But you got to look for it first. You got to see it first. You got to be willing to take the opportunity to show the love of Jesus to somebody. This is exactly what the Good Samaritan did. Exactly. The priest went by and there was a guy that had been mugged and left for dead in the ditch he didn't even go over. A priest, mind you, he didn't even go over to see if he could help. The Levite, person that worked in the temple, came by. He looked and kind of went and peeked and said, well, whatever, somebody else will help him. And it wasn't, that man received no help until the good Samaritan came by and said, somebody's got to help the man. I am here. I have the resources. Uh, you know, we are geographically in the same location. So God must want me to help that person. And that is, it, that's where the love of Jesus starts. It starts with a believer that will recognize someone in need and will, and will, and will allow Jesus Christ, the Lord, to work through them to help that person. But we got to see it first. We have got to see somebody that's in need and we have got to fasten our eyes upon them. We can't just glance and then walk away as in, I didn't really see that. Somebody's got to see it and somebody's got to help people. So the point number one, the opportunity to show the love of Jesus is as we, as we recognize others in need and we, and we fasten our eyes upon them as Peter and John did here. What they were about to say, well, you know, the fact that they saw them and fastened, uh, saw the man and fastened their eyes upon him, that was going to open the door for them now to witness to the man. Yes, they were going to meet his need. They were going to meet his physical need and they were going to heal him. But point number two, 
the opportunity for the church is it, we have the opportunity to speak of the love of Christ. Look back at verse number six. They first saw the man and they fastened their eyes upon him. And then verse six, and Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He didn't just put his hand on the guy and say, rise up and walk. No, he said in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he's preaching a sermon here. <laughs> Excuse me. He's using the opportunity to help somebody to be an open door to now bring them out and introduce them to the one that heals, which is Jesus Christ. It's not just, hey, here's a buck. I'm going to help you today. Here's a dollar. It's in even past that. It's not that put their hand on the man and we're going to heal you. No, everything was about pointing that man to Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what they did. They took the opportunity to speak of the love. They didn't just say, here, we'll help you. <coughs> they said, no, we're going to introduce you to the one that can heal you. So the, the man that was born lame in sin knew very little of the cure that he really needed. Keep that in mind. As we see people and then as we, as we take action and go to help people, most people in this world today are just trying to figure out how to get through the day. And we should help them do that. We should use the resources and the riches and the wealth that God has blessed us with. And we should use those things to help other people get through the day. But what kind of a Christian are we? What kind of believer are we to have the answer to eternal life? The answer for eternity and not share that with people and leave them even with a 20. Oh man, I was a, I was a really good Christian today. I gave $20 to this beggar out there. Yeah, but did you say anything about Jesus? Did you put a track with it? Do, and look, and we've all done this, but did, did we just gave him money to get him through the next few hours and not introduce him to the one that can get him through eternity in the presence of God? We have an opportunity to show the love of Jesus as we pull ourselves away and we fasten our eyes on people in need. And then number two, we have the opportunity to speak of the love of Christ as we introduce them to the Savior. <coughs> Not just meeting their need today, meeting their need for eternity. Giving them the cure <coughs> for their crippled soul. We are so about, and even there are good people in this world today that, that, that they, want to, they want to meet the need, the physical need of crippled people. And I'm, and I, look, and handicapped people, I am for that. But we have the most important answers and we can fill the most important need. We meet their need physically, yes, but we also introduce them to Jesus Christ that can cure their crippled, handicapped soul. What greater work is there? And we have got to see that not as drudgery, but as opportunity to partner with God. There wasn't long ago here that somebody contacted the church, contacted me uh, through Facebook here, and he had a need. He had a physical need. And uh, so I thought, yep, well, I'm going to help. And he told me, told me he needed some money. And he told me why, and he told me the amount. Well, it happened to be an amount that I could handle myself. So I just said, I'm, I didn't tell him, but I said, let's meet up, and I'm going to help you. And so, but the whole time I thought, I'm going to need his physical need, but I'm going to need his spiritual need. At least I'm going to offer the answer to his crippled soul. Sure enough, went and spent some time with him at his house, uh, gave him the money uh, that he needed to help with a problem that he had, but then introduced him uh, to Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. The man prayed on his, uh, on his steps there outside, on his step prayed and got saved. And that's exactly what God is trying to do with our churches in which every member. That's not just the pastor's job. That's not just a pastor's opportunity. It's the opportunity of every person that's in the church. 
It's to go about meeting people's needs, but using that as an opportunity to bring them into the presence of Jesus Christ and the one that can meet their need for eternity. Uh, 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 Dealing and, and, and ministering to their crippled soul with salvation through Jesus Christ, redemption, uh, uh, introducing them to the personal relationship that they can have with Christ. So what are the opportunities that we have that we see illustrated here in Acts 3? Three, number one, the opportunity to show the love of Christ, but we got to get out of our own way and just get about the, 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 the business of the church Number two, the opportunity to speak the love of Christ as we meet their needs, uh, as we show them of our compassion. Let's introduce them to Jesus Christ. Number three, the opportunity to serve in the love of Christ. I know these things, these are all actually interrelated. It's just one step after the next, but the opportunity to serve. Now, what I mean by this, look at back at verse seven of chapter three. First, he fastened his eyes upon him. He got out of his own way. He got out, Peter and John got out of their own plans and diverted to help somebody in need. They desired to show compassion on somebody. And then in verse six, they introduced him to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And uh, as they healed the man and they made it very plain to him that it was Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now look at verse seven. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. They reached down. This is just building on the same thought, but they reach down often. Now look, often we will, we will turn aside to help somebody. <clears throat> well, you know, we see that a lot, and, and so we'll turn aside. And, and, but, but here's the thing. A lot of times our help, it, 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 the, 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 circum, the circumference of our help is a track. I mean, we've already talked about helping them physically and being able to have pack, as long as we have the wherewithal, let's have compassion upon them. But then, but then sometimes we don't and we just give them a track. And, and I'll be honest, when we do that, sometimes a person takes a track and says, oh, does, what is this? Is, is this, will McDonald's take this uh, for a meal? You know, can I go take this to Wendy's and get a meal on it? They are so, they are so, Uh, not acknowledging their main need, which is Jesus Christ and a relationship with him. All they're thinking right now is alms, alms. Peter reached down and picked the man up. I see that reaching down as rolling up your shirt sleeves, your coat sleeves, taking your coat off, rolling up your shirt sleeves and getting down and getting into the messy sometimes work of helping people straighten out their life. That is an opportunity. Uh, you know, if, if we've done everything so far, if we are conscious and we're soul conscious and we're looking for people that need help and we're helping them with their physical needs and we're introducing them to Jesus Christ and we're leading people to the Lord through that, that's good. But there's another step. There's another opportunity that we can take. And that's, that's continued service of a person. Often, We'll give them a 20. It's kind of like, yeah, I did my deed. Be, good, be okay if I don't see you again the rest of my life. Often we give somebody a track and say, well, there you go, buddy. Good luck with that. And we walk away and kind of button in the top button of our coat and, you know, patting ourselves on the chest and, and on the back and say, I did my job today. No, you know what? Sometimes we need to get more involved. Sometimes we need to reach down as the good Samaritan did. He went to the man he, he bound up his wounds. He put him on his, his animal. He took him to an inn. He took money out of his pocket and left it with the innkeeper and said, care for this man until he's healthy enough to get on his way. And if it costs more, the next time I come by this way, obviously he knew the innkeeper. He said, next time I come through, I'll pay you what I owe you. That's what you call rolling up the sleeves. That's what you call rolling up your, you know, taking your coat off and getting, getting involved in somebody else's life for the long haul. A 
Sometimes we're really good at throwing a 20 at somebody. And sometimes we're even good about handing out a track. But what about that next rung on the ladder? What about that next opportunity to get into the opportunity of, of I almost say full-time service. I don't mean from a paycheck point of view. But I mean like when you meet a guy and you meet his need and you went into the Lord and I mean you continue to minister. You grab down and you say, come on, I'm with you. You put, put, his, put his arm around your neck. You put your arm around his waist and you say, well, I'm going to help you through this until you are well and better. And even after that, I am here for you. How about that step? Often believers stop after the, the initial help of a physical need, and maybe even after the initial witness, we stop there. We don't want to take that next step and, uh, and to actually reach down and to pick somebody. Look, what was, his, what was his physical condition that day? You think that he had showered that day? You think he was you know, dressed like I am today, a nice pair of pants and a sport coat and shoes? Everybody who's been behind this podium right here tonight, dressed in his nice clothes. You think he was dressed that way? You think he was kicked back in some kind of nice chair? No, I doubt it whatsoever. The man was a beggar. He begged for money every day just to buy food to get to the next day. He couldn't even get himself there. <coughs> into that place. Somebody had to take him. I picture a man that was in rags and tattered clothing. I picture a person sitting in the dust with his legs, you know, I don't know how he would sit, with his crippled legs. Maybe he was laying there. I don't know. Yet Peter reached down and took him by the hand. And the, if you read the Bible, the later, later, later there in the same story, it gives the indication that the man got up and was hugging Peter and John. As he went into the temple. And as I mentioned this morning in the service this morning, if that would have been happening today, that would have been the selfie time. And you would have seen that on Facebook. He'd have had his arm around Peter, <coughs> and the Peter around John, and he'd have been clicking that off and posting that right away, and then clicking down at his legs and saying, Look at my legs, they are whole. Back then, he was just running around and leaping and coming up and hugging. Why? Because God's people said that we have an opportunity to show our compassion, to introduce somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ, and to not only that, to reach down and get involved, to get involved in their life and to bring them up. Whose life have you touched? What person, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about the pretty people in life. And we know what we all mean about that. We mean about people that are capable and, and, you know, and they have the wherewithal to dress and they dress nice and, and they're educated to some extent, you know, and, 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 and they go through life and, and you know, maybe, maybe people admire them in certain ways. I'm not talking about that. Those people get help all the time if they need it. They got resources everywhere. Everybody wants to be there for them kind of people. I'm talking about the down and outer. I'm talking about the one that can't get out of their own way. I'm talking about the one that can't see past today and is looking for the next meal. I'm talking about the one that maybe doesn't smell the best. I'm talking about the one that maybe doesn't dress the best. I'm talking about the one that, that has very few opportunities in life to take care of themselves. I'm talking about reaching down and grabbing that person by the hand and lifting them up out of their circumstances and saying, I'm here and I'm going to help you today and I'm going to help you for the rest of your life by introducing you to the Lord Jesus Christ and that I'm going to be there for as long as it takes allowing Jesus to work through me to help you put your life, to put a life together. This man didn't even have a life. He didn't even have a plan. What was his plan? His next meal. I'm talking about people of God that are willing to invest into people and to pick them up, brush them off, clean them up. I'm talking about help for the long haul, serving for the long haul. Now, point number four. 
Now, in this in this situation here, my point reads the opportunity redeemed. In other words, we see Peter and John that had the compassion and wanted to show the love of Christ to this man. They had the compassion and wanted to take the opportunity to speak of Jesus Christ to him. If you check the story, if you keep reading, you'll see that as the man was walking around, jumping around, other people gathered around, of course, because they see this guy that they see every day out here begging alms, begging money, and now he's running around and jumping and leaping. An incredible, uh, an incredible miracle has happened. And the people looked at Peter and John. And Peter said, why are you looking at us like that? He probably said, close your mouth. You don't look very intelligent right now. <laughs> you, you know, people looking at him like gaping. Like, what just happened? What did Peter and John just do for this guy? Peter said, Peter and John didn't do anything for this guy. It was all Jesus Christ. You know, the one that you crucified and put on the cross, that's the one that is alive today. That is the one that died on the cross and buried and rose again the third day and sits at the right hand of the Father. <coughs> and the, he is the one that saved this man today. He is the one that healed this man. We are simply vessels. But that's the opportunity of it all. And they took full advantage of the opportunity to minister to that man, met his, met his needs for eternity, healed him. Now the guy can go out and get a job, can provide for himself, gave him a new plan in life, introduced him to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They, they took the opportunity that God gave to them and allowed God to meet the man's needs. And you find that in verses 8 through 11. How great they must have felt. Can you imagine going back and talking to your family after a day like that? Can you imagine going back and saying, hey, honey, <laughs> I got to tell you what happened today. Stop what you're doing. Stop making supper. Stop, uh, you know, stop working. Stop doing whatever you do. Put the kid down. Finish feeding him later. I got to tell you what happened today. Can you imagine Peter and John going back and sharing with their friends and their community of believers and their own families about how, what great things that Jesus Christ had did through them that day? Look, I've done a couple funerals here in the last month or two. At one, we had six people saved. At another one, we had seven people saved. And, and, and uh, Tim, where's Tim? Tim scooted out of here. No, there. Yeah. Uh, Tim went with me to Good Samaritans Ministries two, let's see, we, let's see, two months ago. No. Yeah, two months ago. And we preached there, and we were able to win two people to the Lord there. On every occasion, I went back and told my family, hey, let me tell you what happened today. Let me tell you how God saved six people at this funeral and seven people at this funeral and, and how God saved two people at the Good Samaritan's ministry. No, it is the most great thing to, to, be, to understand that God gives us opportunities. And his opportunities is, is using us as a vessel through which he can do his work, but us yielding to that. And there is nothing greater than going back home and sharing of the opportunity that, that we were smart enough to grab a hold of. And then talking about it and then encouraging other people about it and being encouraged yourself by it. Being used as a vessel of choice to do his work. Submitting to him. What a privilege. What a privilege it is to partner with God. What a privilege it is to say, I really enjoy, in this, I really enjoy doing this in life, but I'm going to cut back on that. Because I need to give more of myself. I need to give more of my resources. I need to give more of my energy. I need to give more of my time to the partnership that I have with God. God says, I'll fill you with my spirit. 
You just be submitted. I'll lead you along the way. You just be aware. I'll bring people to cross your path. You just be ready. And you be ready to acknowledge it. And you be ready to, to allow me, Jesus says, to do my work through you. Opportunities. It's not work. I've used the word work. I've used the word job. I've used the word responsibility. I could use the word duty. It is all of those things. But for the believer whose life is in tune with Christ, it's opportunity. It's privilege. To serve him and to be used by him. There's an Israeli settlement uh, named Netzarim, N E T Z A R I M. It might be Netzarim, but in the heart of the Gaza Strip. And this, is a, this place was a point of much conflict with mil, militant Palestinians for several years, Israelis and militant Palestinians. The conflict was so great that the settlement was evacuated in 2005. It was evacuated. Got to get out. Just place a war. It's all this is. Those who lived in Netzarim did so at great personal risk because they felt it was an important part of keeping their land free. There are those that said, I'm not leaving. This is our land. These are Israelis that said, this is our land and we're not going to, we're not going to leave it. Forget what <coughs> all the problems are and the danger of it. We're not leaving. It's our land. Those who lived, uh, uh, well, I just read that. Uh, and Netzarim did so at a great personal risk because they felt it was an important part of keeping their land free. A school teacher who lived in this city in 2001 said, I don't live where it's comfortable. I live where it's important to live. What would happen if Christians quit worrying about being comfortable? What, what, what would happen if, if, if believers started doing what was important to God? Being used of him to take the opportunities that are so abundant and that God desires to use us to reach people. The opportunity of partnering with him. What would happen if all of God's people consecrated their lives to the work of God and said, I'm going to do what's important. I'm going to stop lavishing great things and wealth and spoiling myself. As this person here that refused to leave this city said, I don't live where it's comfortable. I live where it's important to me to live. How about we start not, how about we start uh, not doing what is comfortable and what is fun and what is uh, 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 pleasurable for us and let's partner with God. Now, and you know, I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm not saying you give away everything and live like a, a hermit. Or, you know, of course, you're not helping anybody living like a hermit. But I'm not saying that there's no time for fun and laughter anywhere. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we focus way too much on that. That's exactly what I'm saying. And God has given us the opportunity and privilege to partner with him to do his work. How are we going about that? Are we surrendered? Are we putting him first? Are we, are we, are we enjoying the, the service of the Lord? Are we enjoying and taking advantage of the opportunities that he gives to us to do his, to serve him, to love him, to share him with other people? It's a great opportunity and a great privilege. And it's the opportunity of the New Testament church. To partner with God in his work. Let's pray. Holy Spirit of God, impress upon us the importance of serving you, of using our talents for you, of using our abilities for you, of using our spiritual gifts that you have given to us through the Holy Ghost for your work. Yes, there are times where all of us, I don't think it's wrong to, to take a break here or there. 
take a vacation here or there. I'm not against that. I'm against when we spend our lives taking a break. I'm against when we spend our lives vacationing. I'm against when we spend our lives trying to figure out the next fun thing to do that has zero impact on eternity. Holy Spirit of God, impress upon our hearts to yield ourselves more to you every day to speak of Jesus, to show the love of Jesus, to introduce people to Jesus, to take our coat off and roll up our sleeves and get in, down into the, the dirty part of serving others and in the, in the long time commitment of it. We love you. Please work on our hearts and lives uh, tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, well that finishes up our Sunday evening, and God bless you. Let's take the privilege and the opportunity to serve him, and let's serve him. Let's just do it for the glory of God. We will never regret it, and, uh, and it's quite the joy to be used of him to meet a need and to win a soul and to be just a vessel. It's just a vessel to be used of him to do that. God bless you uh, and enjoy your week. Contact us here to church if there's anything that we can do for you in any way as you are on your journey uh, on this earth till, you, till we see Christ. Uh, God bless you. Good night.